What is the secret to unlocking your full potential? What makes your idols any different than you? How do you become the person you've always wanted to be in life? This is where you get all of your questions answered. My name is Justin Shank, and I sit down with some of the most epic individuals who are changing the world with their actions in business and in life. We discuss how they did it, why they pushed themselves, and more importantly, how they were able to focus on continuous growth to achieve their dreams. Welcome to the Growth Now Movement. This week, I sit down with Susan Winter. Susan is a best-selling author and relationship expert specializing in higher thinking for an evolving world. She writes, speaks, and coaches on cutting-edge partnership models as well as traditional relationship challenges from a platform that fosters self-esteem and personal empowerment. The crazy thing is Susan wanted to be an opera singer and you'll hear in this episode how she really started to live with intention and how her life kind of called her to become this relationship expert which landed her on shows like Oprah which is insane and she's now an international best-selling author. Susan and I have a lot of fun as we unravel what relationships are today and how it's ever evolving and how we should show up in our relationships. You'll also hear her path to become an expert. So if you're somebody who wants to become an expert in in some sort of field and how do you garner that path to get on shows like Oprah or the Growth Now Movement podcast, uh, you follow her model because she really figured it out and that is living with intention. And I think you guys are going to love this episode because Susan is an absolute gem. I wanted to take a quick second and tell you about my VVIP level available for Growth Now Movement Live, guys. So if you're somebody who's ready to take your life and your business to the next level, if you are somebody who's ready to invest in themselves, the VVIP ticket is for you. You not only get to come to the VIP welcome reception, you not only get to go to the event, but you get to have dinner with the speakers and you get to come to a half-day mastermind with the speakers and movement makers. So you'll be in the room with people like Sarah Centrella, Chuck Balsamo and everybody else that I've announced along with the movement makers like Justin Wren and Sean Thomas and all the game changing individuals that I have been on my show. So if you're ready to level up, go to GNMlive.com and sign up today. If VVIP is something you're not ready for, let's get you there and just sign up for a ticket and join us at Growth Now Movement Live in Reading, Pennsylvania. I can't wait to see you there. Now, without further ado, I give to you Susan winter. Susan, welcome to the Growth Now Movement. Thank you, Justin. Thanks a lot. Dolph connected us via email and I, I dove into your story and I was like, I love this topic. I love doing deep dives in relationships. And you're somebody who you figured something out, you know, and you've ended up on Oprah and all these other insane shows talking about what it is you talk about. So why don't you just briefly take a couple minutes and introduce yourself and, and who is Susan Winter? Uh, so I am a best selling author and a relationship expert. And I came to this, Justin, uh, by a side, you know, my personal life suddenly became a part of a professional life. I came to New York City as a professional opera singer. Which did is not, crazy. I saw that. I know. I know. And I had a theater degree and I did that. And then I got tired of your, your life is mostly auditioning and on the road. And I thought, okay, I got to try something else. I became a corporate spokeswoman because the language was intense and I knew how to handle it. And I knew how to, I had the kind of bearing and presence to be able to communicate complex ideas. And then I got, I realized I couldn't go any further in that. And then I just kind of uh, retired and built a home in the country, an hour from New York in the most remote part of Northwestern New Jersey. I built my McMansion <laughs> on a golf course. I thought I was gonna have this amazing life. I thought the town and country lifestyle, I moved out of New York. And I'm in the middle of what is the consciousness of Appalachia, like deep. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? And so that became my dating pool. Oh no. And um, I'd had a younger boyfriend, 16 years younger. We'd lived together. But when I had a partner out there, I kept seeing this lovely guy in my gym. And he was so inquisitive and curious and intelligent. And might I add, absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be on the Stairmaster. I'd be reading this huge book on metaphysics and, you know, like doing my little thing. And he'd come and talk to me. Uh, long story short, I never knew that after a year of discussing things with him that he was, he had a crush on me and had fallen for me. 
And when it became evident, um, I thought, oh, boy, I, I had an internal sense. I am going to pay for this. Mm. I feel it like, oh, I'm going to pay hard. But I was, you know, that internal thing when you're pulled towards something, you, your logical mind goes, no, 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 danger, danger, warning, warning. And your gut and your everything about you is drawing you toward some part of your destiny, some part of that that predetermined part of your blueprint that you, you need to examine this. It will be the catalyst for something else you need. It's not even about the guy at that point. It's about some point on the spectrum of your journey that you must meet this, this event. Oh, totally. I stepped into it, and boy, did I pay. His mother had decided that um, well, he was he flipped from 18 to 19. I flipped from 39 to 40. Again, imagine Appalachia, okay? So my neighbors all made they, – they found a much better story, Justin. They thought, well, she looks amazing, but no guy would rightfully fall for a woman some 20 years older. So she's a witch. Oh, maybe she's a prostitute. Oh, no, I was a witch, a prostitute, a lesbian, and like orgies and all this. Wow. Stuff. Oh, because because here's the here's the kicker. It, it couldn't be that they love each other. It couldn't be that they really like each other. It couldn't be that they have pizza night on Friday or they go to a movie and they work out in the gym together because, of course, he's there to gain, I don't know, social status or money and she's paying him off and she's controlling him and she's a manipulator. So it had, you know, so the external was so potent. So here's where we uncover the limited consciousness of a human nature that when we look at something that's different, we tend to make it bad. Mm. Different is bad, right? To yeah. some people. And I didn't want to be the guinea pig for that concept, but I'm there. I'm in the middle of it. And I'm looking at my life and I'm thinking, okay, I do not remember signing up for this. Like if there is a pre-life where you raise your hand and go, okay, okay, I'll take curing cancer or, or I'll take, you know, world peace. I did not young guys, I want to do <laughs> Never. I wouldn't have gone to college had I wanted to do that. You know, I would have just, I don't know, gone to the gym. So that's where I found myself. Mm. And I had to finally, after seven years of being quiet, never fighting back because I couldn't pull my partner from both ends. You know, my friend suggested we write a book and I just pen and paper just let it out. I love it. Didn't, didn't know how to get that. This was when publishing was a really big deal to get a published book was amazing. Yeah. You know, um, and we were unknowns, but boy, did I have a message. And um, so when it got published, I happened to also be very good on television because I'd worked in broadcast. I worked for Financial News Network, which is now CNBC. I forgot that part of my journey. So, um, and I, I was passionate. So I think the communication of the concept was timely. So that's kind of how the media picked up on me. And I never used a publicist. I never wrote Oprah. I never asked for anything. Didn't have a, I didn't have a website for another eight years. I didn't know how to do emails, really. That's amazing. I attribute that to absolute pure intention. Mm. Landed in a situation I didn't anticipate. I looked at my life. I wasn't going to give him up to end just because I was receiving the most horrific treatment. It didn't feel right to me that you should be harmed because of love. It, you know, it would have been fine if he were a toy. Believe it or not, people would have been cool with that. Yeah. But the fact that he, I, I loved him and he lived with me, that was an issue. So after like five or seven years, I couldn't take it anymore. We were fighting all the time. and He was being driven crazy and his mother was lying to him. And I don't know how she got the things she would... I don't know how she did this, but she would get his friend and they'd slept with me. I don't know how she paid them off, manipulated them. I don't know what she said to them. This poor kid, it was tearing him apart. It was just, we couldn't stay together. Yeah. It was, she basically said it's her or me and us. And so nobody should have to go through that. You know? No, that's crazy. So have, so how long ago was that? Oh, see, I think we broke up in like, we find he helped me move to New York. So that was like 98. So okay. you're talking about mid nineties. So that was a whole different, and, and in a, outside of a metropolitan area, New York city, nobody would have paid attention. Right. So it's interesting to me, like, because you're saying these things and I'm not, uh, I'm a very honest person. I think I would even think that stuff even now. Have you, have you seen a shift in 
the oh, world yeah. as far as how they're viewing it? Oh, gosh, yes. That's when I knew I could stop. You know, I had a message of inclusion. I had a message of just, listen, men have been doing it for years. But when a woman does it, you think something's up. Yeah. She's fucking him. She's like woo to his mind or something. And maybe, maybe she, he loves her. So here's the, here's the center of that nugget. You know, when you peel away all the sensationalism of all the interviews, and all the people asking, all the questions, the bottom, the center point is that we do not believe that a woman has value or that anyone would want her if she's not young and beautiful. Mm. You see, youth and beauty are still looked at across the board as our own worth. I mean, we can run countries, we can run companies, it doesn't matter. And that, to me, was frightening in the 21st century. Yeah. It used to be our virginity, so we'd made some strides, okay? Because a woman was valued for her virginity. And still, in many cultures, okay, now. So I thought, wow. The only reason they're so offended by it is that it they don't know how to make women make sense and have value as a complete and total person. We can't age. We can't get older. We can't be out of shape. We can't be undesirable. We're useless. Yeah, that's that's just you're you're right. And I never thought about it that way. And and that's something that um you know you've become a massive part in that movement to move forward. And and you know you'd mentioned like I just I just had to get this down on paper. It was almost like uh you were. You were allowing yourself to vent through through writing, right? And now it's helping the world or, or it helped the world really kind of shape their mind and going forward. And, and you said all of this happened with intention. Can we talk a little bit about that? I love in, uh, doing things with intention. I love that thought process. So can we unpack that a little bit? Yeah, I hate marketing. Uh, I was raised with British uh, manners and politeness and we do not push it's vulgar we don't ask we don't we don't even collaborate we try and do everything on our own so it never even occurred to me to push it wasn't about me when I started interviewing people that had gone through this uh, Justin people that had been in this kind of relationship 10 years plus but some 20 years earlier where they had to leave Madeira Island and go to the Finca in Portugal because they were driven out of their community. I met these people. I saw these women sobbing. I remember a policewoman who said to me, we've had to find forgiving friends. Mm. And she's crying. And I'm thinking now the burden is now I realize, oh my God, because I knew. So alchemy, okay. Uh, in my metaphysical training, I thought, okay, <laughs> this is so profound. You got to do something with it. It landed in my lap, so let me do the only thing I know to do. Let me spin this. Let me flip it. Let me take the negative and make it positive because it's got the same charge, right? For as bad as it is, I, I've got to be able to flip it to super good. Otherwise, it wouldn't have landed here. I know what to do. Let me see if I can do it. And so that's why I started fighting so hard. And when I started fighting for those people, I, then I had no fear. Mm. And I remember when I got the galleys for the, the book, they had so poured milk and water through it. They edited I wrote, knew every word I wrote because I lived it. And I didn't write about myself. I didn't tell my story. I wrote at I wrote it philosophically and giving information and we and we interviewed other people. Right. But I'm reading the words and it's like, God, they were so bland. And I thought, okay, okay. And I remember playing praying over the galleys and saying, Okay, if it gets one woman in Ohio and changes her life and makes her feel okay, then let this be done. And I just, because I, I didn't have a game plan. I didn't have a marketing plan. I didn't have a website. I didn't have social media. I didn't have it. Yeah. And, well, 11 years later, I didn't know what I was, I just had a message. And it's like, it pulled it to me because it was so pure. I, it was a miraculous experience. It I wasn't about me. There, there's so much to that too, like, cause it's almost that part of it. And I want to get back to relationships too, but like that part of the journey is very much similar to mine. Like I put this podcast out. I have no, I had no idea what I was doing. And then all of a sudden, like, I just knew that I wanted to help people. And then, yeah. and then when, it, when it finally aligned, everything started to click and, and the show started to grow and, and ink, you know, magazine recognized me and all these other things. And I was like, what is happening? Like, it's this crazy thing. And I interviewed a guy. You talk about you hate marketing and, and you hate the idea of like selling and it just, like I interviewed a guy named Philip Stutz who uh, he he helps with like political campaigns and now he owns a, a massive business that helps people with their like their presence essentially and I interviewed him and he was like dude 
he goes, I've been listening to your show for a while. Um, I've always been a fan. And he's like, your online presence is the worst. And he's like, I have no idea how you're doing what you do with like, with your presence. And I'm like, that's a, like, that's so crazy, but it's so true. I believe when you set an intention to truly help people, the world, you know, rewards you. It gives you the tools you need to then succeed in what you're doing. How do you, I, I'd heard people that, you know, send gifts to Oprah, write her books. I didn't have a publicist, a little tiny publishing house in New Jersey that didn't do anything but answer the phone when they'd call. And, <laughs> I love it. You know, like, oh, okay. And they, then they'd call me and they're like, okay, I thought it was normal. Justin, my, my mind was so distorted. I thought you just get a call. Oh, today's show, I'm doing the today show. I just knew at four o'clock I had to bring my cell phone with me or my beeper or whatever I had at the time because I knew at four o'clock I didn't have anything from California that I was free. I thought it was normal that, you know, CNN, ABC, CBS, the nighttime news. I, I just thought you get this all the time. New York Times. I thought, oh, they, they, they must do this when you do a book. I didn't know. <laughs> I love it. That's so great. That's so, so great. So you go through this journey of, you know, you, you just happen to, to connect well with younger people, uh, and then it becomes your mission and your message. And now all of a sudden you become this relationship expert. Do you ever feel like there's a burden being that person? Yeah, no, but I did want to grow. And one thing is that if you've become established in one area, uh, thankfully I, when I did get a website in 2000, uh, Eight, I think I got a landing page. In 2011, I got an active website, right? This is so long after all this stuff. This, yeah. Oprah was like 2003. Um, I, 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 I wanted to expand. I don't want to have the same conversation. I'll be happy to have it. But if I can't grow and I can't continue expanding and I'm not meeting today's needs, then I get bored and I want to leave. Because basically, before Oprah even, I remember thinking, I'm done. Mm. I could see the shift. My job was done. I walked away from it. I'm like, okay, what do I want to do now? Because whatever it was, it fell in my lap. I did it. I did the best I could with it. I, I didn't want this for a career. Yeah. But when I saw modern dating and all the hookups and all the people crying and then they'd call me and they, I was always the one to counsel people. And I thought, oh my God, this is so messed up. And I had this, this feeling like the one thing that was needed was the one thing nobody was able to do is that they needed to approach modern dating with all this scary scenario with an open heart and a, and a self possessed dignified love that they give that, that only an active love and an open heart can attract another heart that's scared and closed. But I thought nobody's going to take that journey. Nobody. Cause they're like, I'm not feeling it's going to hurt. So I, then I spent the next six years dating really the worst guys in the world, bad boys, players, half my age, no skill set for a relationship. Cause I had to prove that I was right in the worst case scenario. Mm. If I could shift that, if I could open up a closed heart where I had no no standing whatsoever. I had nothing working for me. If I could do that, then a regular girl with a regular guy could, you know, benefit from my information. So then I got on that tangent. I love then I it. Doing that. So, so what was it? The challenge of is that is that like, or do you feel like you wanted to do good for these people who had a closed heart? Yeah, I I I wanted to stop people from hurting each other. Yeah, the pain. Emotional pain around romance is devastating. Nobody understands. I mean, it can you, you can lose yourself. I remember my first heartache in college. I want. I used to pray that I die just to make the pain go away because mm. I didn't know. You know, you merge. You don't have boundaries. You just ugh, and you, then then they walk away, and, and you're so such a novice and a newbie that you don't understand you're going to survive it. And you think that you'll never feel love again. And they took your love away and now you're sad and you're happy. And now you're, oh, it's terrible. And I just, I wanted people to be more loving and yeah. I wanted, I just wanted the pain to stop. Yeah. So let's talk about that pain. Cause I think most people at some point have had heartache. Uh, oh. And then, and then we move on to the next one and then it happens again. And then we move on to the next one and it happens again. And like that, I think that's the t trajectory for most people, except for my best friend, Mike, who's been with the same girl since he was 15 years old, not <laughs> kidding, um, which is crazy. Uh, but, but how do we begin that healing process? Because I think it is, it's inevitable, right? We hope that it doesn't happen, but it does. H how do you begin that healing process and to be able to move on? Like what's the important steps to, to be able to move on from that heartache? 
from a, from a heartache? Okay. First of all, we live in a time period where the information is so much better. Oh my goodness. And everywhere. We can watch YouTube videos. We can read books from the, our, our favorite leaders. We, we can get free information all over the place to very specific things with just keystrokes. It's amazing. So not having had that, I think I still believe in using the mind to control your emotions, mm. meaning how you frame the experience and how you tell yourself that you're seeing it has everything to do with how you are going to feel about it. You are never able to walk away from a loss and feel good about it until you find the win. You must find the win or you cannot see the benefit and you can't move on and you'll be resentful, you'll be angry. You know, understanding that, I think philosophically, to understand that life has challenges and life and loving people involves pain. It involves pain when you're upset with them. It involves pain if they leave you. It involves pain if they die. It's going to hurt. It's going to be blissful and it's going to hurt. You don't get one side of the coin. That's You don't just get day and no night. It doesn't happen. You get life. Right. You get We've got to accept that philosophically and put on our seatbelt and just go on that ride and say, okay, I'm with you, but let me have some real tools when I get to a challenge. Let me know how to think about it, think my way through it so that I can alleviate the needless pain. There's going to be pain, but let me let it not affect my self-esteem, my self-worth, and let it not take me down. And like, So there are specific techniques we can use to work our way out of that. The number one thing is to try to see it in the – have you ever seen like tweet deck or something like that? Yeah. Tweet like this. That's our life. These are the moments of our life in the in the arc of your life. Okay, we start, then we have all this experience, and we're going to end. I mean, really, it, there's there's a lot of stuff going on. It's right. not. The, it feels like the only thing in the world. It's not the biggest thing in the world, and we will survive. Then the question is, how do we make it through? Because I like to find a win. I have to find the benefit. What did I get? How did I? How did meeting this person benefit me? Even if it's just, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's all you can find. I'm never doing that again. But if you can't find some benefit, something that they showed you, that you learned, that, you, that added quality to your life or sparked an interest that, 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 that is going to lead you to the next point in your path, you'll never be able to leave it and feel satisfied. Yeah. Yeah, I I love that. And I, I think that's key too. Like it's just a shift in perspective, right? Like yeah. I, and that and and I like how you kind of tied it to other things in your life because that is that's how I approach everything. Like people, you know, what I've been through people are like, "How'd you do it? Like how are you doing all this thing?" It, it's all all perspective. Like big believer in life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you react to what happens to you. You then create your future. You create your life. It's it's not happening, right? Like you create what's happening. Um and I believe that to be true in most things, but relationships are tough. And that, you know, I, I told you before I hit record that I've, I've had a tough time in my life, you know, navigating relationships. And, and it's because every, everything else in my life, I have control over. But you don't yeah. have control over a person. And so how do, like, all of a sudden it could be just, just be gone. Right. And I think that that's, that's kind of the crazy part about relationships and why I would never ever want to be a relationship expert because it is a journey for everybody and everybody has their own path. And, you know, I like the fact that you kind of grabbed the bull by the horns and said, you know what? I've solved this thing. Now I'm on to this thing. What's next for you? Oh, next for me. Oh, I'm playing around with video and I really like the interactive component. Mm -hmm. I have this, um, this app that I've been using that I love called Magnify, and it's uh, where it's on demand. I know that the future of counseling is on demand, right? Yeah. A person gets a pain, but I'm having them call me on Magnify so they don't know my number. And I have a two-way conversation with them where the, the, the listeners can see and hear me talking to a real person, and I get to really talk to them, and they can hear what I'm saying. So it's like a town hall. So I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying interactive speaking i i don't like i i mean i know i'd be a good keynote speaker but i don't like to me i don't want to memorize something i want to just talk to people i want to really share i want to go off on topics that they want to talk about and have us talk about it together so i like that live component and uh right now the only thing i'm doing is trying to manage all the clients i have it's it's phenomenal i don't really advertise these people, Justin, listen to the end of like a seven-minute YouTube thing where I say, you can call me, you can do blah, blah, blah. That's it. Yeah. But I found a portal where there is an audience, 
and the audience is interested. And that I value because what I'm trying to do now with my instruction is to help people find their power in the right order, not ego power, not games, to find their, you know, love is simply the vehicle. When, when a person comes to us, it's, it's, a, it's a vehicle. It's, it's like we're going through our own evolution via this path, mm. the person path. We can't do it without them. You know, it's like interacting with them kind of jars loose all of our thinking and all of our insecurities that comes bubbling up to the surface. And we can look at it now, but also in partnership, we can work on it together. We can come. We can become better versions of ourselves in alignment with another person. So, what I like to do is to teach people to find their power, find their words to express themselves and be the best version of themselves and love and survive that journey. Right? Yeah, I think so many people look for happiness within a relationship when they're not happy themselves. So how important is that journey before you find love to be able to kind of be okay with yourself? And like, how do we navigate that process? You know, ideally it would be phenomenal, but we have to admit in the entirety of love, not everybody's together when they meet a partner. They're just not. You are where you are on your own spectrum of evolution. Mm. You're going to attract at that point, somebody who mirrors you. The downfall is if you're really depressed and you're really desperate and you're really needy and you call somebody in in that desperation, that energy of desperation is going to only add to your problem and then you're going to be compounded and you're going to go down, 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 down. Yeah. That's when you need to take a dating detox, a break, sort yourself out, do something you love, get some advice, go to therapy, go to the gym, love something. If you can't love yourself, love a cause, love a purpose, lo love puppies, love, I don't know, clean <laughs> Have something. Find your find your contribution where you feel rewarded. Yeah. Right. And then try again. And it'll you'll be coming in on a different angle, right? No, yeah, I, I love that too. And then and so I just had a conversation with a guy when I was out in LA, um, and he talked about uh he he's somebody who is a he's a professional singer, so he's the lead singer of a band that tours the world. And we were chatting and he's like, you know, I'm trying to get these relationships and he's like, and then I'm trying to balance it and all these things. And, and I, I kind of said to him, I don't know where this came from, but I was like, dude, like you, you just have to be you and you, you should be able to focus on your things and the right person will support that. And, and no, no matter what that looks like, you don't have to juggle. And like, this is somebody like, like I said, he's the lead singer of this band that travels the world. Like he shouldn't be listening to some random dude. <laughs> like he didn't know me from somebody else. But, um, what I see with you is that like, yeah, right. And, but like what I see with you is you've done this, right? So you've hit this, this platform and you've done your thing. Um, and you've had relationships throughout. Like how important was focusing your, on yourself in order to call in the right person? Does that, does that make sense as a question? Yeah. I, I chose the worst case scenarios, but I'm curious. You know, it's like I could, I, part of this, when I was on my journey, I was kind of locked into this thing and I, 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 I can only explain it like this. Sometimes I feel like I've already made some agreement to be who I am here. Like I'm just walking through the motions. Like part of me is aware of it as a human. The, the observer is kind of looking at it. Like you get on, you, you get on a ride and then that bar comes down. You're on that ride. And there are times that I've felt this sense of intermission. I can't stop. And I've looked at myself and thought, oh girl, you are masochistic. And I'm like, no, I'm not masochistic. I know there's a lot of pain, but I got to figure this out. And it's like, it's like doing recon, you know, like sneaking through the enemy lines, get the information, then get out and then tell people. So there's, and I don't know that there's ever a perfect relationship. I don't know that I believe in that. I don't believe in the one. There are multiple the ones because there are multiple paths. Yeah. I believe that it's our evolution. We choose partners along the way because we want to, and it's nice and it's beautiful. And you can also not choose a partner. It, that doesn't mean your life is unfulfilled. So I think it's about our commitment to our growth, our evolution. People come along like leading characters that can be the they can be the great lead, you know, the leading man or woman, they can be the villain. They all play a role in our evolution and we do in theirs. Yeah. So it's this intricate dance going on. But I think in the end it's about us. In all the weeness and us. I, I think us and the individual. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah, I love I love all of that for sure. The um I I I took a look at your website before we hopped on this call 
And I saw an article that was written about infidelity. And I think infidelity is something that scares all of us. Like, it, nobody wants to be cheated on. It'd be the worst thing in the world, right? That's embarrassing. You know, we thought they loved us and so on and so forth. And and your take on that as far as how do we – I think it was something titled, like, how do we tell somebody that we cheat? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk about that for a second because your take on it was very interesting to me. <laughs> you gotta uh, so- remind me because honestly, I do um, I seven or eight interviews a week. I don't even remember. <laughs> I, I barely scan them and then put them in. So um, tell me what my take was because I, I just yeah. So the, I think the question was, how do you tell somebody that you cheated? Like, what's the proper way to tell somebody you cheated? Okay. And you said you don't tell them. I I I I, I wouldn't if it's if it's a one off. Yeah. So you know, like the twelve steps. Like a lot of people know that one of the the, the tenets in in the the big book says you know like two husbands that have cheated it's written in 1935 like don't unburden your guilt on your wife if it's a one off if you had a drunken night at a conference you know your partner was out of town you had tied one on with the girls it's a mistake it has no impact shut up and moderate your drinking or stay away from it and don't do it. That is going to, I don't believe in telling all, 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 all. Now, if it's an ongoing pattern where you find yourself looking and wanting, tell your partner before you cheat, I'm having problems. Some part of me is desirous of other people. Help me to, can you identify what it is that's missing in the relationship? If I do, will you help me? Uh, Another thing is, um, if you find that it's ongoing and you're having an affair, you have to be honest and figure out what is it about me that needs to be in this affair. Am I greedy? Am I uh, feeling unloved at home? So you that then you have to make a determination. Are you going to quit the affair or are you going to come to your partner and tell the truth? Mm-hmm. But I, for a one-off, I wouldn't. A, a single night where you got loaded, I would not say anything. If it becomes a pattern, you got a problem. Sure. And then you seek help. Yeah, and then, and then there's something wrong, in my opinion, in the relationship. Absolutely. Yeah, you're seeking something else. Do you know that most people cheat because they feel devalued, unappreciated, and undesirable in the eyes of their mates? Because in long-term relationships, sometimes couples start to bicker. And it's, it's, it's not so much about the young days of early honeymoon love. It's about, did you take out the garbage? Who's going to take care of the kids? You didn't pick up Jimmy. I told you to get the milk and you got the love of, you know, it's like. So it's, it's sometimes we forget to be appreciative of our partner and, and most people are looking to look into somebody's eyes and be seen as, wow, you're amazing. If we haven't said that to our partner, we are doing ourselves and the relationship a disservice. I believe in massive cookies, throw cookies at the partner, throw treats at them like dog treats. You know, they got you the water. Thank you, honey. You're so considerate. I saw that you moved the, uh, the garbage cans today. I want to thank you so much. It helps and mean it. Yeah. If you want your partner to have great behavior and keep them happy at home, let them know how much you value them and you won't have to deal with this cheating thing unless they're a sex addict. That's a small part of the reason that people cheat. Really sex is a very minor reason on the spectrum of cheating. Yeah. And, uh, and it's funny cause like I'm, I'm a, because I was so terrified of relationships in my previous life, I like to say, um, I observed other people's relationships and really paid attention to why things were happening. And what I realized was, um, and I'm one of those people that everybody tells me everything. Like it's just been my whole life, like people unload. And so like, there's like couples that I knew where the one dude was unloading and the woman was unloading. And what I realized was they both wanted more attention, but neither was willing to give the attention first because they weren't getting it. And it becomes this terrible cycle. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. That's the root of so many of our modern day problems. It's what I call somebody gets offended and they retract. Mm-hmm. The other person gets offended to that reaction. They retract and you get further apart. Now I have to counsel. Do you know what it's like? My, my men and women, their first insult that they have from a partner, a new partner, existing partner is to punish them by pulling away. Or, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask you to do something counterintuitive. I want you to give love. They're like, I want you to start being nice, start sending text messages. They're like, they don't deserve it. I'm like, don't you want to start a pattern of you got to start? And then they're like, oh, my God, I did this. He was more, he was more loving than he's ever been before. He told me he loved me. And I'm like, you got to feed the good. We starve the bad. We feed the good. That's just, it's got to be that way. Yeah. I was a goofy looking kid in, in high school. Um and my senior year, I was very, very goofy on purpose. Like I like grew up my hair. I've never said, shared this on the podcast. I like grew up my hair and I have this photo 
uh, that was on my school ID senior year. It wasn't my actual photo because like the senior pictures, I had to look good. Um, I found this school ID yesterday and I took a picture of it and sent it to my girlfriend. And I said, would you have dated me in high school? And like, I was joking clearly with this question (laughs) and her response was very real and it kind of hurt my feelings. She goes, honestly, no, that was (laughs) it. That was her response. And I was like, ouch. And I was like, oh, okay. I was joking with the question. And then, but and then immediately she gave me good. And she's like, but clearly I would date you now. She's like, you've become very handsome. And I was like, oh, thank you. Oh, my so, God. so like it comes, it comes around, right? So like, I think that you need to be super smart, but you also have to be honest. Like if you weren't going to date me in high school, honestly, no. And I was like, ah, that hurt a little bit, even though I knew that was the answer. Like you should have known I was joking. Anyway, I digress. Yeah, things in place in your relationship, you can afford to do that. Do you know what I say? Do you know how secure you have to be in the fact that you love each other for her to say something like that? Yeah. No, it's true. It's it's very true. Like I I appreciate you saying that. Um, you know, to look at it that way too is so different. Like to just be like, oh well, she feels comfortable enough. She knows how much she loves you. She can afford to say that, and she's not going to lose you because of it. Because, you know, and bottom line, she's coming home tonight. You're going to be there. It's it's beautiful. You yeah, know. It's very, very true. I love that. So, you know, I, I, I get the opportunity because of this podcast to interview very, very successful people and people who have really done it, however you define success. So my question for you is, what's your definition of success, and what are three things you do every day to ensure that success? Oh, boy. What's my definition of success? Oh God, that's not easy. Cause, yeah. Well, you know, in the Western world, it's unfortunately it's either recognition and or money. Mm-hmm. And so oftentimes my thinking has been tainted by that. Yet all those years that I was unpaid, just doing my job, holding people's hands, listening to people's phone calls. I think that that helped me to be the success that I am today. I didn't, I wouldn't want to be a relationship expert. No offense. It's got no cachet. Are you kidding? <laughs> coach? I mean, like opera singer, broadcast moderator, television anchor. That's it. Like, what is that? But I found, I think success is where real success is where you take the talents and gifts that were innately given to you and you focus them and bring them to life to aid and assist in the evolution and transformation of others. Wow. Yeah, I love that answer. That's a phenomenal answer because uh, I totally agree with you. Like, that's really, really great. Um, I wrap up all these episodes the same way, and that's with five rapid fire questions. But before we get there, how do people get a hold of you? Where do they, where do they get your information? I know you're on YouTube, but where, where do they go specifically? Come to SusanWinter.net, and everything is on my website, my coaching packages, the Magnify information, the on-demand, the videos, the YouTube, and start there, and then all my social media is attached there, so I do all of that. I love it, and her her videos are great. It was funny, because I I went, and you posted something 22 hours ago. It already has almost 7,000 views. Well, really? That's great. Yeah. I do two a week, so it's big. It's a lot of volume, you know? Um, so I give, I give kind of potent information. I've stayed away from the marketing dramatically successful. Uh, it's always a fine line for me, Justin, to put out real quality work that I believe in that I want to do and also follow the rules of marketing enough to be viable. You know, I don't want to, I'm not going to do five tips to win the guy. (laughs) Yes. I I just want to do that. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Yeah. Totally. And, and you're right. Like you have, unfortunately it's part of the game is the marketing. Like I have to share these things out. I have to, you know, my branding has to be on point. It's all part of it. Um, but, but again, like I, you know, as long as you're, you're putting out serious content and the intention is to help people, oh, yeah. everything works out. Like that's really kind of where this all began and that's how we're tying it up, which I love. But we'll get into the five rapid fire questions. Some are fun, some are serious, but I ask you this answer with only one word or at the most one sentence. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. So the first one is, what is your favorite smell? <laughs> fresh. So like, like, uh, like fresh, like linens. Uh, fresh grass. It's probably fresh nature. Fresh yeah. green. Awesome. Vitality in nature. Love it. If you were on death row, what would be your last meal? Oh, good Lord. Probably the same thing I have every day. Boiled chicken and the spinach salad and something like that. I don't <laughs> as long know. as you like it, right? That's all that matters. Oh. No, I would be hardly be creative at that point. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't understand how they eat their last meal. I've always thought about that. Like, I'd be too uh, sad. Just be like uh, awful. I, oh, I, I. You know, I. 
I, I listen. I, I had no idea you were asking these questions, so I, I, I don't even know how to answer that one. I love it. If, if you could have dinner with anybody, living or dead, who would it be? Oh God, you know that's different every day. I choose my father. Mm. He died in 1988. I prayed that I could just be one equal to his toenail clipping. He was such a fine human being, and I would have loved him to live long enough to see who I am today. And see what I did. Hopefully, that he would be proud of. Yeah, I think I think he'd be a little proud. That's amazing. That's really really cool. Um, so the next question is: At the end of your life, if you could only be remembered for one sentence, what would that be? That she tangibly shifted the evolution of social consciousness toward greater love and inclusion. That's awesome. And obviously this podcast is called The Growth Now Movement, so I wrap up every single episode with this one question, and that is, in your life, what has been your biggest moment of growth? Oh, wow. My greatest pain. When my entire community and everyone I knew turned away from me and no one was there for me when dating the younger guy, the unbelievable torment of losing social standing, my reputation, when I had nowhere to turn, I found myself. Brilliant. Isn't it, isn't it brilliant how challenges are designed to bring us forward? But nobody told me that, but I went, I learned it. And so now I want to share that, you know? Amen. Susan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come on and share your wisdom with my audience. And just thank you so much for living in intention, because I think the world needs more of that. Uh, we need to stop listening to what people tell us we should do, and we should just listen to our gut and follow that. And just thank you so much for doing that. Justin, you are a beautiful man, and I mean that in every sense of the word. What a beautiful, beautiful message, and I really, truly feel what you're sharing with everybody, and I'm moved by who you are and how you're showing up in the world. I just got to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being in the infantry line of social consciousness and growth. You're awesome. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Growth Now movement. This is how you can really help me out. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that fun stuff. And let's grow this movement to epic heights. And it's all going to be because of you guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week.